mausoleums in the Soviet Union, housing three such important historical figures that after their death, it was decided not to bury, but to embalm them. The first one was built in Vinitsa for the surgeon Pirogov. Within the second one in Moscow lays the leader of the revolution, Vladimir Lenin. But few know of the third one. Odessa Oblast is a small town in Kotovsk. Here, there is the crypt mausoleum holding the embalmed body of Grigory Kotovsky, legendary Red Commander of the Civil War. This mausoleum was built immediately after the mysterious murder of Grigory Kotovsky and buried inside of it, along with the body, remains a hidden mystery of the death of a man more influential than Stalin. Odessa Oblast in August of 1925, Shebanka village, where Olga Kotovskaya was in the final month of her pregnancy. She suffered, often, from pain and insomnia. That long, hot night, she could not sleep as she waited for her husband Grigory to return. At around 2 a.m., the wife of the Red Commander finally managed to fall asleep. Suddenly, Olga awakened, startled, Clutching her stomach, Olga ran to the window. Outside her window, in the street, a crowd flocked. People surrounded a body. Sprawled on the ground, it was Olga's husband, Grigory Kotovsky. Chebanka villagers were terrified. Who would dare to kill one of the most influential people of the Soviet Union? During his life, Grigory Kotovsky was dubbed the chieftain from hell. Although a thug and a murderer, as Russia's Red Commander, Stalin regarded him to be the bravest among the humble Soviet commanders and most humble amongst the brave. What was never mentioned in the Soviet propaganda was who Grigory Kotovsky truly was and who, in fact, needed his death. Olga Kotovskaya lay crying, grasping her pregnant stomach. Her new daughter, Lenochka, born only a few days later, would never know her father. The wife of the dead Comcor was stunned by what followed. While her relatives collected around her to calm her, the former commander's comrade, Zayda Meyer, silently entered her home. Unlike the others, Meyer did not attempt to comfort her, nor did he offer his help. Instead, he knelt down beside her and begged forgiveness. It was he who killed her husband, his friend Grigory Kotovsky. Olga Petrovna became hysterical, driving this murderer from her home. In the confusion, Meyer vanished and a few hours later was arrested. News of the Kotovsky murder reached Moscow and flew from mouth to mouth, creating a huge scandal. Kotovsky had been loved by millions of Soviet citizens. However, something quite unusual occurred. The death of the Comcor was simply ignored. Only a single newspaper reported the murder in Chebanka, the Pravda. We managed to find a rare issue stored in the newspaper department of the Vernadsky National Library in the Ukraine. On the night of the 6th of August, it reports, at the Sovkoz Chebanka, 30 miles away from Odessa, the untimely death of a member of the Union, the Ukrainian and Moldovan Central Election Commission, commander of the Cavalry Corps, Comrade Kotovsky. Why was the manslaughter of this legendary Comcor so modestly reported? Just a single mention of no more than an untimely death. Even the murderer's name was not specified. The day following the murder of Comcor, a group of embalmers arrived in Odessa from Moscow. It was headed by Professor Vorobyov, who in 1924 embalmed the body of Vladimir Lenin. Medics began working on the body of Kotovsky. Meanwhile, not far from Odessa, a mausoleum was being erected. 
In 1941, the mausoleum of Kotovsky was left to its fate. Unlike Lenin's mausoleum, this one was not removed from the town during the German offensive on Moscow. And the first thing the Nazis did on their arrival at Kotovsk was to destroy the Komkor mausoleum and dispose of Kotovsky's body. Coming up, whose way did this legendary concourse stand in? Who gave the order that executed murderer Zayda Meyer? Why do historians now call Meyer the first Soviet killer? We will meet the grandson of Grigory Kotovsky and find out what secret his grandfather had been hiding his whole life. We will also learn why all the investigation materials mysteriously disappeared after the death of Kotovsky to be confiscated to the special funds of the security service. And we will find a place where today lay the bones of the legendary Comcor. Chebanka village near Odessa. Two gunshots murdered the Red Commander, the man of legend, Grigory Kotovsky, the killer his comrade, Zayda Meyer. However, his motive remains unknown. At first, Meyer insisted the murder of Kotovsky was no accident. Raging jealousy, he claimed as his motive, because of an alleged affair between the Comcor and his wife. During an interrogation, she proceeded to deny her husband's allegation and testified that there had been no intimate relationship between the two. The most probable cause for his murder and the likely events of that fateful night were soon to be discovered. Yes, the fact was, he did slay Kotovsky. Nevertheless, this more likely happened because the concourse stood in the way of Meyer's career. At that time, Meyer had been security chief at a sugar factory. During the trial, he admitted that he wanted to become the head of this factory. But Kotovsky did not want to promote him, and this resulted in the Comcor slaughter. This became the story behind the murder. Why then, after such a deviant act, did the frightened murderer wind up on his knees begging for the forgiveness of Kotovsky's wife, Olga? Nevertheless, the murder investigators accepted this motive as true. A swift trial followed, but the verdict shocked everyone. By law, Meyer should have been shot with his family deported to Siberia. But the assassin of the great commander was not executed, simply sentenced to a 10-year imprisonment. What's more, although this was a time that even minor thieves were executed in this country, three years after this verdict, Kotovsky's assassin was mysteriously released for exemplary behavior. Quite extraordinary that during this morally deficient time, crammed with brutality and loss of millions of lives in the First World and Civil Wars, with a country so swathed in human blood and life of such little value that the state so easily reversed itself to spare assassin Meyer Zayda. Grigory Kotovsky and Zayda Meyer met in 1918. At that time, Kotovsky had been an underground Bolshevik agent and a bandit chased by police and Meyer was owner of the best brothel in Odessa, one of the richest men in the city. Zayda Meyer was one of Odessa's first slaveholders of whites. Girls from Odessa and the Ukraine were by force shipped to Turkish harems and brothels, dependent territories of the Turkish Empire, Egypt, North America and to Europe. Zayda Meyer headed over a filthy business. Ironically, even his own sister and wife were prostitutes in his organization. Fleeing from a police chase, Kotovsky found a place to hide within Meyer's brothel, where he found protection while in pursuit. Meyer concealed the fugitive for several days while feeding and caring of his needs. At this time, the two became friends. In 
Zayda Meyer lived in this house in 1918. However, four years later, Meyer became homeless and without a livelihood. This time, Kotovsky returned the debt and found Meyer a place to work. However, what ultimately made the former owner of the brothel betray his comrade to pull the trigger of a gun not once, but twice? Coming up, the true life story of bandit and comcor Kotovsky. What linked Kotovsky with Meyer? Why would historians call the owner of the Odessa brothel the first killer of the Soviet Union? Also, an incredible find, Kotovsky's autobiography. In 1924, one year prior to his death, Grigory Kotovsky wrote a manuscript, his memoirs. However, his disclosed birth date had been falsified along with six years of his life conveniently left out of the document. But why would Kotovsky need to deceive? Grigory Kotovsky claimed in his memoirs that his birth year was 1887 in the Moldovan town of Hincesti. But historians are certain that Kotovsky lied. He was actually born in 1881, six years earlier than the date in his autobiography. What secret was the legendary Comcor hiding? What happened during these six concealed years? It turns out that for six years, until 1917, the legendary commander had been a criminal. A huge number of modern adventurers and criminals correct some of the dates, which may include their birth and hide some details. Why would Kotovsky do such a thing? Perhaps to hide some previous convictions? For example, Kotovsky attempted to conceal information about his first conviction. As for the more recent criminal convictions, he constructed a tale told to fellow Bolsheviks that he defended the poor and shared the spoils with the common folk of Bessarabia and the Kherson province. Here is the real story behind the life of the Red Comcor, later discovered through research. Kotovsky had been a descendant of Moldovia. In his early childhood, Gregory fell down some stairs, which may have contributed to his obtaining a stutter. This caused the boy to become reserved and rather shy, rarely communicating with his peers. He, however, adored reading and liked to dream. In his dreams, Kotovsky imagined himself the famous robber of Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood, or pirate Blackbeard, sometimes Tarzan. To this unhealthy spirited child, all of these heroic characters seem to be attainable divinities. There were five children in the Kotovsky family, with Grigory the youngest and the most impressionable. The sudden death of his mother led to the young boy's first attack of epilepsy soon after her funeral. Little Grigory Kotovsky watched his mother die. It was difficult enough she died, but he was forced to witness this. And again, this coincided with his first attack of epilepsy. This seems to have contributed to the struggles he encountered throughout his life. He stammered badly and he became uncomfortably nervous. At the age of 14, the boy carried on in life with epilepsy, with the stigma of a stutter. Then, he had lost his last close comfort, his father. Now, he would have to care for himself, and so he enrolled himself into a school of agriculture, where he turned much of his attention to his body and strength. As a result, this former weakling became the strongest amongst his peers. His character hardened, and he began to control everything with his will. People around Kotovsky began to respect, even fear him. In her memoirs, Kotovsky's sister Sofia reveals that at that time, no one could beat Grigory. He could easily put anyone who dared to mock his stuttering defect in their place. 
Kotovsky became a statuesque boy, actively into sport. While he was fond of reading, he revered his adventure books. His favorite, Tarzan. The book captivated him. Naturally, it also influenced his adventurous character and the way he perceived his actions. Kotovsky experienced his first love. To receive the diploma of a specialized school, he had to undergo some on-job training. Grigory became an assistant manager of the estate of Skopovsky, the landlord. The landlord's wife became attracted immediately to this self-assured, handsome student. Soon, they began to meet secretly. However, the affair was split up by the husband. Landlord Skopovsky discovered the affair. As Kotovsky recalled in his writings on discovery, Skopovsky raised his whip and struck him with all his might in the face. What occurred next sealed forever Kotovsky's fate. In response, Kotovsky counteracted and began to beat the landlord until stopped by the servants. The landlord then ordered his men to beat Grigory almost to death and then undressed him and threw him out of the estate. Nobody ever humiliated Kotovsky like that again. Insulted and beaten, he walked off. After that, Grigory tried twice to locate a job and briefly worked for other landlords, but his bad reputation haunted him. At another job, he was accused of feigning documents, then of stealing the money. This caused a police chase, and Kotovsky had to hide. The next two years, having no job or money, he knocked about North Moldova, in Bessarabia, where he often committed petty thefts. It was here that he first acquainted with the Essas, activists and members of a terrorist group banned in the Russian Empire, a socialist revolutionary party. The group provided Kotovsky with clothes, food and accommodation at their secret address. Grigory found much in common with them, first and foremost, a hatred for the regime. It was then when Kotovsky felt like a hero from his favorite children's books, Robin Hood. With his help, dozens of estates in Bessarabia were plundered. Robert Kotovsky became wanted as a dangerous criminal, a reward placed on his head. It took several months for the elusive Kotovsky to decide to secede from the Essers to plunder landlords on his own. Kotovsky found himself 20 reliable men, former peasants, prisoners, workers, even circus actors. Landlords feared and hated Kotovsky, and his plundering attacks became legendary. One of Odessa's landlords boasted he was not afraid of Kotovsky because he built an alarm button connected to the police station onto the floor of his cabinet. When Kotovsky learned about this self-assured landlord, he effortlessly broke into his estate. Instead of commanding the man to raise his hands in the air, Kotovsky, with a smile, told the frightened landlord to raise his feet. Feet on the table! I said now! It is not known whether he actually shared the money with the poor peasants, but people literally prayed for this audacious robber. Kotovsky constantly stated he was Robin Hood, that he robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. But this was not entirely true, because he and his closest friends accumulated a large quantity of loot. After several years of pillaging and collecting, Kotovsky became rich. He dined at the best restaurants, appeared in public and no longer talked about his political preferences. But his former friends, the Essers, saw through him. 
To avenge him, they informed the police of his secret address, where the bandit leader hid. Kotovsky was later arrested. At the trial, he proudly christened himself Robin Hood and claimed his actions to be dictated by his honorable sense of justice. The judges, however, were not amused and he was sentenced to 12 years of hard labor. Chisinau Prison. From the earliest days of his imprisonment, Kotovsky devised an escape plan. After his big trial, he became popular as a convict. Women often came to visit him in prison. These women were romantic fans, swayed by this famous noble bandit and his tales. He was aware of his charisma, his pizzazz. He realized just how handsome he was. He became a woman's man. In his lifetime, he had a number of passions, books, sports, horses, and of course, women. As a matter of fact, women would save the romantic bandit several times. One particularly fanatical female visitor helped Kotovsky implement his plan of escape by sneaking in a pack of cigarettes laced with opium, a lady's gun, a file baked in bread, and a thin silk cord. Everything Kotovsky needed to escape. So one night, Kotovsky gave the cigarettes to the guards. Once they were out of commission, he then soared through iron bars and made his daring escape. This, however, was just the start of his prison saga. Kotovsky lasted a mere few days outside of the prison walls before he was once again arrested, brought this time to Nikolaev, a strict security prison, and from there he was transported to the east of Russia. Kotovsky sat in prison 10 more years. He built, along with his fellow inmates, the Amur Railway and worked in the Nachinsk mines. Viktor Fatelberg Blank, researcher of the gangster world of Odessa, believes that during his prison time, future legendary Komkor Kotovsky was not an inmate who just sat passively around. It's more likely that he veiled his activities while behind bars, and this helped him to build an underworld reputation in the criminal sphere. In this circle, he belonged to its elite. Not only did criminals become aware of it, but also the police. This is a description of Kotovsky, which followed him during his transportation. Height, 174 centimeters, strong constitution, staggers while walking, round head, brown eyes, stammers. Kotovsky had tattooed eyelids, and that indicated he belonged to the highest hierarchy of the gangster world. His tattoos consisted of dots encircling his eyelids in a figure of eight. When he became a Red Commander, Gregory Kotovsky wanted them removed. But in those times, there were no specialists. And so he had to go through life with them on his face. And when he died, the tattoos went with him. Such tattoos thus implicate him and his life as a bandit and underworld leader. It was 1913. The alarm sounded at the Nachinsk mines. Escape. Among the prisoners, one was missing. The underworld leader, Gregory Kotovsky, escaped, killing two guards in the process. This time, he was never found. He spent two more years in hiding, working as a loader, and finally appeared in Odessa. By now, Gregory was 32 no longer a young outcast student, nor Robin Hood. He was a former prisoner and experienced gangster. Out of prison, he carefully prepared for brand new attacks. Within a few years, Kotovsky became a terror in Odessa's gangster world. It was believed he could read minds simply by looking into other people's eyes. He would learn about people by using his eyes, which he did often. He would categorize men and choose the ones he liked to be part of his crew. In those days, Odessa was the crime capital of the Russian Empire. Numerous underworld gangsters operated in this region. The police simply had no time to catch all of them. They were looking specifically for Kotovsky, searching all his secret addresses. But Kotovsky lived out in the open at the best hotel of Odessa, Bessarabia. Before each raid, Gregory carefully disguised himself. Every time he went out, it was in a new image. Kotovsky was renowned throughout Odessa, an extremely famous figure. 
newspapers through the years 1915 through 1917 were loaded with his pictures. This meant that he could have easily been identified. Nonetheless, if he attended the theatre or went out, he would simply stick on his face a beard or a moustache and become incognito. These facts of Kotovsky's life were to be later concealed within the Soviet Union's official history books. And Kotovsky himself purely eliminated the years from his own memoirs. What remained were only high-flying, blurry lines. By force and terror, I took away material possession from exploiters and gave them to those who needed these riches. Without knowing of the party, I was already a Bolshevik. Three years of freedom from jail equated to three years of debauchery and plundering. But by 1916, his luck ran out. Legendary robber caught. Romantic bandit Kotovsky brought into police station. Robin Hood of Bessarabia was taken. These became the headlines making Odessa's newspapers. Police triumphed. It was during a raid that Kotovsky fell into their trap and finally found himself behind bars. Primorsky Boulevard 7. In 1916, fates of thousands of prisoners were decided here. In this building was the military district court of Odessa, and it was here that Grigory Kotovsky was tried and convicted. In 1916, the Russian Empire was engaged in the First World War, lasting two years. The country was in a state of martial law. All death sentences were to be approved by the commander of the Western Front, General Brusilov. As Kotovsky awaited his execution, he wrote a petition for clemency. But rather than addressing his petition to the general, he sent it to the general's wife, Brusilova. She read a letter overflowing with repentance and written as if a dramatic work and felt remorse for the handsome bandit. A few weeks later, General Brusilov replaced Kotovsky's death penalty with life imprisonment. 1917, revolution. The provisional government leads the country out of war with political prisoners released. However, convicted of robbery, former condemned Kotovsky does not receive this amnesty. The civil war bursts out and the front is destroyed. Ruin and famine spreads across the country. Suddenly, from the prison cell, criminal, bandit and recidivist Kotovsky requests that he be sent out to the front. He wishes to atone for his past with his own blood. This is incredible, but a man with this heinous past, once convicted to die, is released. Kotovsky passed the cavalry regiment military training in one crash course and went on to war as a private. In a few years, he became a commander, then joined the Bolsheviks. This is where his talents became fully appreciated. Here, his own brigade took under command and with a mission to destroy the remnants of the UNR army and Denikin's forces. He immediately introduced his new brigade to iron discipline. Horses must be of the same color. Soldiers must wear clean and expensive uniforms. Men must do morning exercises, then douse themselves with cold water. Kotovsky's orders were not open for discussion. Desertion, rape or murder of peasants were punishable by execution. 1918. Odessa's rule is in constant change. The city becomes white, then red, and then independent. But despite everything, Kotovsky remains in Odessa. Sometimes he has to hide from his pursuers. It is during this time a certain man visits the best brothel in the city. He is met by the owner of the establishment, Zayda Meyer, who asks what kind of woman the client wants. This visitor answers that he is not interested in a prostitute, but in need of a key to the attic. Meyer, recognizing Kutovsky, hands him the key. 
The brigade commander spends a few days in hiding within this attic, and before he departs the establishment, he informs Mayer that he is indebted to him. 1920, Kotovsky is the best commander of the Red Army. On his chest are decorations of three orders of the Red Banner and the honorable revolutionary weapon, the sword. These are the highest awards in the Red Army. They were received for the destruction of the army's remnants in the Ukrainian National Republic, for the liberation of Tiraspol, for the suppression of the peasant uprising in Tambov province, and for the termination of the army of Ataman Tutunik. Coming up, historians are certain Stalin himself is involved in the murder of Kotovsky. We will visit Kotovsk, find the tomb of the commander, and learn why Grigory Kotovsky was slayed. The civil war has ended. This year, the Bolsheviks liquidate the last brothel in Odessa. Zayda Meyer is left without work. And so he pays his own visit to Kotovsky, who owes him a favor. And the commander appoints Meyer as security chief of one of the sugar factories. December the 30th, 1922. On the map appears a new country, the largest in the world, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The civil war is over, and Lenin becomes the first leader of the country. But after two years, Lenin dies, and in his place comes Joseph Stalin. Stalin begins a struggle for the sole control of the country. He doesn't need any rebellious leaders. During this time, the country is led by its military men, many of them with dark pasts, murderers, robbers and gang leaders. Grigory Kotovsky is among his chief people. Out of Kotovsky's advice to Stalin, Moldavian Autonomous Socialist Republic is added into the Soviet Union. Kotovsky himself becomes its informal leader. His aim is to capture and unite all the lands of Bessarabia, even those belonging to Romania, However, the CC does not want war with Romania. Kremlin politicians, however, are too busy with the internecine wars to protest. Stalin, by eliminating his rivals, is advancing to a sole rule. Kotovsky is forbidden to aggravate this political situation. This enrages him so much that the Concord leaves his corpus and goes on holiday with his wife and son to Jabanka village in Odessa Oblast. 1925. Kotovsky is now 44, a married man and father. He has a son. A few days later, his daughter is to be born. Their holiday is interrupted by a telegram from Moscow. The People's Commissar of the USSR appoints Kotovsky his deputy. In this country, ruled by military men, he is destined to become the Prime Minister. Grigory Kotovsky celebrates his victory. He hastily packs his things and gets ready to go to Moscow. But in the evening of August the 6th, on the eve of his departure, Kotovsky is invited to a party. 2 a.m. Kotovsky returns home. He turns into his yard. In just a few steps, he will be at home. Suddenly, Kotovsky notices Mayer. Komkor is pleasantly surprised. He doesn't expect to see his friend in Chibanka. He stretches out his hand in greeting. Mayer also stretches out his hand, but with a revolver in it. Turning away and clenching his teeth, Mayer pulls the trigger. Kotovsky falls to the ground, but he was still alive. Then, Mayer takes a second shot. This shot is fatal.
On this site of cottages, there was once old Chabanka, the village where Kotovsky was killed. Mayer, who murdered the legendary commander, was sentenced not to execution, but to 10 years of imprisonment. Of the 10 years, the killer remained in prison for only three. He was released for exemplary behavior, but Mayer didn't enjoy his freedom for long. Men of Kotovsky awarded him with a death sentence. Modern historians claim in the mid-20s, Stalin began to consolidate and gain sole power in the USSR. He managed to remove his main competitor, Leon Trotsky, from leadership. Among all the Red Commanders, only Frunze and Kotovsky remained disobedient to him. It was Grigory Kotovsky who Stalin feared the most. He knew he was a cruel and influential man, subversively supported by the army, and this meant he needed to get rid of his opponent. Kotovsky was an extremely devious person, difficult for the authorities to control, and he was connected to the criminal world, where he maintained strong ties. This man was connected to business. What's more, this man was attempting to make himself a leader of the Moldavian Autonomous Republic. More than likely, he would become leader of all Bessarabia as well. Stalin himself would not be able to accuse Kotovsky of treason to execute him. The soldiers trusted their commander way too much. Thus, a move like this would likely have caused a military coup. But by hiring an assassin, he could get the job done cleanly. What's more, this had to be a person from the commander's surroundings, otherwise it would not be possible to reach him. Therefore, Stalin hired Zayda Meyer. However, how he convinced this poor former owner of a brothel to commit this heinous crime is still a great mystery. Historians remain certain that this was the first contract murder in the Soviet Union, and Meyer was the first Soviet killer, and the client was Stalin, personally. Elena Kotovskaya named her son in honor of his grandfather, Grigory. We have managed to meet him and learn exactly whom he and his mother believed to be guilty of the murder of the legendary Comcor. I believe it was actually Stalin, because he wiped out so much of the Soviet army and intelligentsia. Despite the fact that he was a shrewd man, he'd done many horrible things while he was in power. He was a terrible dictator, and Stalin could not tolerate competition. We know Frunze died on the operating table. He wasn't through, he was killed. There are also rumors that suggest it was on the orders of Stalin. A number of other prominent public figures were killed too. The grandson of the Comcor has said that immediately after the murder of Kotovsky, all of the remaining investigation materials were then transported to Moscow. I know that Stalin came into power very shrewdly, and he managed to push aside all other major public figures to come to power. Apparently, he was a cardinal. He already had some kind of power even back then. He assumed that if Grigori was replaced by Frunze, he could be dangerous. And so Frunze was killed. We head now to Bazula, a small town in the Odessa Oblast, this is where Grigory Kotovsky was buried. Now, the town of Berzula no longer exists. 73 years ago, it was renamed Kotovsk, a town in Odessa Oblast. It was here, where before 1941, that a mausoleum held the remains of Kotovsky. The Comcor was buried with honors. At his funeral gathered thousands of soldiers. His wife stood near the coffin. She was about to give birth.
when the salute was given in honor of the Comcor, Olga Kotovskaya went into labor. The last child of Kotovsky, his daughter Lenochka, was born and never saw her father alive. The child, Olga Petrovna, would only see her father behind the glass in the mausoleum. However, the embalmed body of the Comcor was not destined to remain there long. During the war, it disappeared and the mausoleum was destroyed. In the heart of Kotovsk, we found a monument. It was established in 1965 in honor of the legendary Comcor. Previously, here stood the mausoleum. It was destroyed by the Nazis in 1941, while the commander's body was thrown into an ordinary pit. Eventually, he was found by simple workers, and in 1944, reburied. It turned out that here remains an underground portion of the destroyed mausoleum, and in it, finally found peace, Robin Hood of Odessa and legendary Comcor Gregory Kotovsky. We received a unique opportunity to get inside the mausoleum, which has been closed for many decades. The bones of Kotovsky rest in this coffin. Today, Kotovsky's grave is a zinc coffin and a dirty blanket which covers the coffin. Under the blanket, there is a skull of the man who once was the storm of the Odessa Raiders, Bessarabian Robin Hood and the legendary Comcor. A few months later, Frunze dies on the operating table. As the Politburo reported, due to an unsuccessful surgery. So why was Frunze sent to that operation? It's a fact that Stalin had already been strengthening his power, and it's clear that he didn't need the independent Red Army. After his removal of Kotovsky and Frunze, there continued a series of murders and repressed stories within the Union. 1936 shot Grigory Zinoviev, the instigator of Stalin's appointment to the post of General Secretary of the CC of the Communist Party. 1937, killed. Marshal of the Red Army, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, and a member of the Politburo, Grigory Ordjonikidze. 1940, killed Stalin's chief opponent, Leon Trotsky. In total, before the Second World War in the Soviet Army, 500 commanders of the highest rank were eliminated. And the first warning signal sounded on August the 6th, 1925, in a seaside village of Chebanka. 